page looking at uh, the life of Saul, and we'll get right into 1 Samuel chapter 17 is where we'll pick up our reading today. And as you're looking there, I'll just kind of bring you up to speed quickly. Saul was anointed king over Israel. And when it was coronation day, when he was being announced as the new king, they, anou they, they announced his name, they called him forward to take the crown, and he doesn't show up. And instead, they find he's hiding in the supplies. The, the NIV says he's hiding in the baggage. He's, he's uh, afraid of this new job that's been given to him. And we could understand why, perhaps, to go from a farmer to the king of Israel in, in uh, you know, one easy step. And he was afraid and insecure. And he turns out to be the worst king of Israel because... Saul never gets over his fear. He never gets over his insecurities. He never gets over his problems. And he continually makes mistakes and, 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 and uh, takes prob uh, uh, the, uh, he makes bad decisions. He can't get people to follow him very well. Um, and ultimately, he never even really wants to follow God. And the ultimate rejection is to push God out because in a false security, in a false sense of confidence, he tries to take matters into his own hands and do it himself. And that's when he really begins to fail. And so we've been looking at this story and learning a few things. We talked about the first week um, how we need to recognize that we have baggage and learn how to unpack with, uh, with uh, friends and God. The second week, we, uh, we talked about um, admitting that we need help. Every one of us has baggage. Every one of us have had, we have history, we've made mistakes, and every day, new baggage gets piled on top of us. We're mistreated, we have to deal with stress, we go through disappointments and anger, we, we have, um, uh, things happen totally outside of our control, and so every day we get new baggage, and we are going to decide, are we going to carry that through our life? Or are we going to learn how to admit we need help and begin to let go? Last week, which um, I, uh, you know, I told the worship team this morning that I appreciated their efforts. I just thought last week was kind of an anointed service as we talked about just the gift that God has given us and how music can help us experience the presence of God. And if we're going through a hard time, if we're going through a difficult place and we just need to know that God is with us, music can take us into a place where we experience Him again. So this week we're going to continue in our story. And, uh, you know, I am, um, a part of me is enjoying this. I'm just rereading this story and trying to pick it apart and, and look at it through these lenses of baggage and just seeing some very interesting things to me. Part of it is I just kind of, I, I'll, I'll read, I'll pray, I'll start to write, and then I'll say, oh boy, here's something I need to deal with and I have to go back and talk with God. And, and so um, I've really been enjoying it. I hope you have too. So we're going to get into our text. Dave David and Goliath is the story upon us now, and it's uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 20 and 24, and if you got your Bibles, we're going to refer to other pieces of this story, and so you want to kind of keep your, your Bibles open. Verse 20, so early in the morning, David left the flock in the care of a shepherd, and he loaded up and set out. He's going to the front lines uh, where the uh, Israelite army has gathered. Um, as, his, as Jesse had directed. Jesse is his father. He's going to take some, some food and supplies out to his brothers. He reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle positions, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines, facing each other. And David left his things with the keeper of supplies, and he ran to the battle lines and asked his brothers how they were. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine, champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. Whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. Now, as I was reading through this story, and you're probably somewhat familiar with the story of David and Goliath. Um, a lot of, of uh, non-church-going folks would probably find those two names familiar. 
uh, one of the more popular stories of the Old Testament. Little David, a young boy with, with no weapons, goes out, faces his giant Goliath. This is a man the Bible describes as being over nine feet tall, and he's just massive, and his, his weapons are just are huge, and he's a, this is the incredible champion of the Philistine army, and young David defeats him. But as I read through the story again, I just caught myself thinking about verse 21, which said, the Israel, Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines facing each other. And so here's kind of what's going on. There was this valley between them, and up on this hillside, all the Israelite army went out, and they lined up across the, the valley, and on the other side of the valley, up another hill, all the Philistine army went up, and they took up their battle lines, and they all stood there looking at each other, and they would, were all shouting at each other this great war cry. This rallying cry, this, you know, this, let's pump up our testosterone, let's get ready for battle, and they're cheering each other on, and then we're going to defeat the army, and they're getting each other all excited, and, and, and getting ready for this, and, and, and waiting for the battle to begin. Now, this means that they had got their armor on. They would have gotten into their formations. They would have marched from camp all the way out to the battlefield, where, where, wherever that was, however far it was. They got out there and they, they all lined up in their spots. They all pulled their, their shields out and their swords from the sheath and they had it in the air and they're, they're pumping their fists into the air. They're, they're waving their swords around and they're, and they're screaming and yelling and shouting at the other, other army. And then with all this frenzy going on, a warrior named Goliath would walk out in the middle of the battlefield and the text said that as he stood between the two armies he shouted his usual defiance. And, and, and that caught me and I thought about it. Now the defiance part is this. He would walk out and he would basically call them cowards and weaklings and no good Israelites but send out your champion we will battle in a winner take all sort of match. And, that's, and he would walk out there and do that. And that. After making fun of them, he would challenge one of their best to come out. But what I found even more interesting is thinking about the word usual. This is his usual defiance, his usual taunting, his usual practice, if you will, because you see earlier in the story in verse 16, and we didn't read back up into this far, but it says that for 40 days the Philistine came forward every morning and evening and took a stand. So every day for 40 days they would suit up. They would get into formation. They would march out and create their battle lines. They would take up their spots. They would shout and rally cry at each other morning and night. Twice a day only to have Goliath and come out and challenge them to a battle and they would what? All turn and run away. <laughs> they all would turn and run away. You know, why did this go on so long? What, what was the problem? And I was thinking through that. What, what was, I mean, were they waiting on the Lord to give them the instructions and the directions of what to do? No, that wasn't it. Were they waiting for the prophet Samuel to show up and get there to help them? Because that was uh, instructions before. There were times when the prophet said, don't do anything until I get there. But that wasn't the case in this situation. Was this a strategic maneuver of some kind, waiting for the conditions and the situation to be just right? No, that wasn't it at all. But instead, we read it in verse 24. It said, every time Israelites saw Goliath, they would run in great fear. And so they would go out there, they would be ready to take a stand, and as soon as Goliath walked out, day after day after day, morning and evening, the usual defiance would happen, and they would turn and run away. And it just causes me to, uh, uh, to think about, again, with the lenses of baggage, that we... Um, to, to ask this question, are we ready to deal with with our baggage and take action. 
Because I think a lot of times we know we have issues. We know we have things. We know we have problems. We know we have things that are dragging us down, weighing us down, things we should deal with, things that we should talk about, things that we need to announce to God. Baggage that we're dragging through life and we don't do a thing about it. We don't move. We don't take that step. So what are some of the things that are happening as they're getting all wound up? And I thought of a, a, a few ideas. Um, why was it that the Israelites were paralyzed in fear? And the first thing I thought of, or notice, and actually it wasn't me, but, but consider this, that part of the reason the Israelites were paralyzed with fear was because they had an insecure leader. That's where our story began and where it seems to continue. This all comes right back to Saul. Now, I was talking with Sandy about this story and reflecting a few ideas with her. And I was discussing with her the story of Saul and how his armies facing Goliath. And she kind of observed this little trinket, if you will. She says, well, boy, it seems like the problem was that Saul was still insecure and wouldn't lead the army, wouldn't take the action. And she pointed it out because Saul, he was the leader. And yet, all through this chapter, it talks about how they all run away. And that included Saul. He's just as afraid. He's just as ridiculed with insecurity. And, and his, his problems, his lack of faith and trust and courage is infecting the whole army. And when you have an insecure leader, it just puts everyone around them in jeopardy. If you have your Bible open to the story still, you can see that in verse 11, when Goliath would come out and make his bold claim, the text said at the end of that verse that Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. And it almost, I mean, it's almost as though he's at the front of the line, which he is because he's the leader. He's the first one, and because of his fear, everyone else is terrified. Saul was a coward. He was terrified. He, he, and he led his army in the same thing. What they needed was his courage. What they needed was a leader. What they needed was assurance, reassurance. What they needed was to be reminded that God was with them. What they needed was to be, to, to, uh, to, to, to be reminded that they were taking a stand as God's people in the world. But Saul couldn't convey the message because he's so terrified in himself. They needed him to say, we're not going to be overcome with fear. They needed him to say, we're not going to back down. They needed him to say, we're not taking our eyes off of God. But instead, he was the first to run and duck for cover. I, I found uh, something kind of fun. Uh, uh, well, it's probably not fun for a lot of folks. Uh, but it was a, a, an article out of the Washingtonian magazine. Um, it was a collection of real-life horrible bosses. Ever had a horrible boss? A horrible leader? <laughs> Um, here's a, just a cut, brief snippets of their stories. Uh, here's one that wrote in about their boss and said, he made anyone late to a meeting stand in the corner for the entire time. So if you were late, that was a punishment. <laughs> Another one said they, they were a, a partner in a law firm and uh, they, ha they uh, witnessed this in their office. So this partner in a law firm, so that's not just a lawyer, this is like a, a partner in the law firm, punched her secretary because she was unhappy with the way that he had cut her peaches. <laughs> yeah, right, he's going to need it. Here's the owner of a small staffing company caught the office manager chewing gum and made her wear it on her nose the rest of the day. <laughs> Unbelievable. Then the last one, I thought, okay, I just wanted two or three. And then I read this last one. I thought, I've got to add this in. It's just, it's like, you got to be kidding me. One boss refused time off for an employee wanting to attend his father's funeral. And the reason was the boss said, quote, 
We need you now. What difference does it make to him? Wow. John Maxwell writes, Insecure leaders are a detriment to themselves and to the organization they lead. They place their followers in jeopardy. The place, they, uh, uh, they, uh, the place where they, their, organ, their organization in jeopardy. And they even place themselves in jeopardy. Insecurity causes the leader to only think of himself. And the very essence of leadership is others. Now, obviously, that was written by a leader for leaders. But here's the takeaway, I think, for all of us today. Because the principle is, is fairly sound. We all lead somewhere in our life. We all lead somewhere in our life. And so it begs the question, where in your life are your insecurities hurting your people, your group, or yourself? Where are you making an impact in, in the people around you, but because of your insecurities and your baggage, is it actually causing harm? Now, maybe you're not the king of a great army, uh, but, you, um, but are you leading with confidence and security? Are you showing those around you that you are competent and completely committed to the God that you serve? Um... I was first thinking of husbands called to lead your home. We had a funeral yesterday. Um, the longest funeral I've ever done. Not the longest I've been to, but the longest funeral I've ever done. <laughs> and, uh, and I knew a bit long uh, as we were putting it together. But really what happened is uh, all the kids got up and wanted to share most of the spouses got up and wanted to share. Brothers got up and wanted to share. Uh, grandkids got up and wanted to share. And on and on it went with the sharing. But every one of them talking about how his leadership, his fatherhood, his commitment to the church, his commitment to God has caused every one of them to be a follower of Jesus Christ. It was incredible. I, I, I was thinking about it and I thought, you know, I, I mentioned this. As I know it was going on. I was hoping to maybe help the audience just a little bit. And I said that, you know, you've probably seen the fear statistics that most people uh, have a higher fear of speaking in front of an audience than even death. And so most people would rather die than stand and, and talk to a group. And yet, to talk about this man, the microphone was a magnet to be able to share. His life mattered to them. Husbands, you're called to be leaders in your home. You're called to draw your, your, your spouses and your families towards God. Parents, you're called to lead your children. You're called to protect them and provide for them, but more than anything, that they would know that there's a God in heaven that loves them. And that their home is a place of security and comfort and love. That their home is a place where God is lifted up and they are protected from things that will take them away from that. Do you have a coworker, or do you lead some small team? Do you have people around you in the workplace that look up to you or maybe you even manage them? You have a responsibility to lead well. You have to be a man of God or a woman of God and treat the people that you lead rightly. You're expected to do the best job that you can do. Are you a boss or the owner of a company? You have an even greater responsibility to do that well. To lead your people well. Now who's bringing their boss next week to hear me repeat this? <laughs> Maybe you organize a ministry or some project in your school or your community. Whatever it is, leadership is about influence. So are you influencing people around you through your identity in God? Are you doing your job the best you can because you know who you are in God? 
Or are you somehow hurting people around you because your baggage is weighing you down? Your baggage is dragging you along. Your baggage is causing an infectious disease in your soul. And it's doing damage to the very people that you should be working to help make this world, working with to help make this world a better place. So we have responsibility here. Second of all, I kind of thought it interesting how they're hiding in their army, army, their armor. Can't you imagine getting all this stuff on every day, marching out to the battle lines only to run away in fear day after day after day, week after week after week. I mean, this is going on for almost nearly a month and a half. And what I mean by that is I think about all that effort and all that work. I mean, at some point, don't you just say, why? What are we doing? What's going to happen? I mean, we know what we're, we go out there, we stand there, we shout and cheer, and then we just run away. Nothing happens. No action is ever taken. But what seems to happen I guess somehow, or, and I'm just kind of trying to look a little bit into the story, they had the armor on, um, but they weren't ready to go into action. They weren't ready to do anything about it. So instead, it becomes a place of, uh, of hiding. It come, it's where they hide, and they hope that they're at least protected, should this suddenly turn. And perhaps you're that kind of person. Putting on your armor is a way of dealing with the giants in front of you. There seems to be a type of armor that people sometimes use because of the baggage in their life. They go into protection mode. They go into hiding mode. When things get tough, they go into, uh, you, know, you know, getting all suited up. Now, one of those things is a way of protecting oneself by hurting others first. Some people use sarcasm to push people away. Some people will put down or get angry before they get hurt. Others seem to uh, avoid people and don't allow anyone to really know what's happening inside of their, their heart, in their, in their thoughts, in their mind. And, and we get closed off. Perhaps you're the kind that is avoiding meaningful conversation. Um, and are only comfortable talking about things like sports, weather. We call those level one issues because they really don't matter in life. And no one's allowed to know your hurts. No one's allowed to know your failures. No one's allowed to know your fears because those have to be carefully hidden away behind a false mask of confidence and an everything is fine attitude. Where are you blocking people out of your life because of baggage? The third thing I thought was interesting is they seem to share this fear as a group. They all go out there and they all get lined up together and then as soon as they uh, are afraid, uh, verse 24 said that when they saw Goliath, when he would come out, it said they all fled from him in fear. It's like this giant chain reaction, no pun intended. Or maybe there was. <clears throat> that they all fled. Now, nobody wants to be the first guy, right? Nobody wants to be the first one to run. But as soon as somebody does, then whoosh, they're all gone and they're all taking off. And, and I guess that's kind of the way I imagine it. I imagine this whole army standing out there day after day. They take up these lines. Goliath walks out and begins ass 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 insulting them and, and assaulting them. And their knees start knocking just a little bit. Their shields kind of start rattling together like, you know, what's going to happen today? How long are we going to stand here? How, how long are we going to have this, you know, pseudo uh, appearance of, of uh, strength? And, and, but these guys are sitting on a powder keg of fear. And as soon as one guy bolts, the, all the rest of them go too. And there's a kind of a group hysteria, a group dynamic, a, a group hysteria that's going on here. And, and, and as long as you're not the first guy that runs away, it's like you have full permission to run with them when the group starts. 
and everybody runs off. Now, again, through the lenses of baggage, we have a saying for this in our lives. Misery loves company. Have you ever been pulled into one of those misery times? We might also have a name for that, gripe session. As soon as somebody says something negative, it's permission to jump in and get negative and trash talk and knock down and talk about how it's bad. It's just permission to fall into the group hysteria about how bad everything is. When we're facing big problems in life, don't we love to find like-minded people that we can complain to and they'll say, oh, you're right. You, oh, you've got it so bad. I can't believe it's going like that for you. I mean, don't we love, we love to find people that, that will help us get angry because of our sense of offense? Don't we love it when there's people around us that will help us actually play the blame game? It's somebody else's fault. It's everybody else's fault. I mean, have you ever done that? I've been sucked into that so many times. It's so easy just to go down the, the negative train. You just needed someone who was willing to kind of be mad with you. Or it kind of along those same lines, and this one's even maybe a little bit worse. But I've kind of witnessed or watched people and, and probably fallen prey to this myself. That we even, we kind of like to make bad choices in life and bad decisions. And it's nice when we can find people that will help us feel like it's okay. We, we, we kind of intuitively go in around looking for people that will tell us, oh, you're fine, you didn't do anything wrong. Oh, that's the way you should have reacted. That's the choice you should have made. That's what you should have done. You betcha. You know, it's like the alcoholic that's looking for drinking buddies. It's people with immoral or deviant behaviors that clump together. I've even watched it in the church when people are upset about something. What do they do? They find a little group that will be mad with them so that they can kind of create a stirring, if you will. They want to find supporters for their fears, their complaints, and their anger. I mean, sometimes we live our lives trying to find the people not that lead us out, but who will actually make it feel like it's okay to keep living the way we're living, to keep acting, saying, doing what we're doing. And the group wins. Lastly, and I don't know, this probably isn't anybody here, but I had to, I just had to throw it in, this idea of shouting the battle cry without action. Anybody good at shouting the battle cry when you're unhappy with things in life? When you're unhappy with the way things are going, when you get frustrated about something, it's really fun, it's really easy to shout the battle cry. The anger, the, the words, the, 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 the sarcasm, the, the criticism, the, the, the negativity, the, the, the knocking down, the blaming, the, the whatever it might be, it's really easy to start shouting the battle cry. But the Israelites never caused this to be something to move them into action. You know, what's interesting is anger is called a secondary emotion. That means that if you're angry, it's probably not because of what just happened, but because of deeper issues that you may not even be aware of. Anger is the reaction to something else that's going on in your life. When I used to do the relationship um, classes and we had a section on anger, dealing with anger in marriage. And, and we would refer to it as though anger is kind of like a smoke detector. A smoke detector doesn't really tell you much except to say that something's wrong. You still have to go find out where the fire is. You still have to go find out how bad it is. You still have to do the work of figuring out what is actually wrong. 
The smoke detector is just telling you something's wrong. It's the same way with our anger. Anger is just telling us that something is wrong. The problem is, is all we, we tend to do is just live out the anger and never look for the root or the deeper source causes. And so we shout the war cry. We go, uh, we go on the rampage. We, we're ready just to kind of clear out everybody in front of us, but we're not really doing the right action. We're not really taking care of the correct issues. And so today's action step, if you will, is just that. What step are you willing to take action on? If, if uh, two weeks ago we talked about being uh, ready or being willing to admit that you need help, then what are you willing to do to start reaching out for that help? Where's the action? Are you just in your life, are you just standing on the hillside? Just, just shouting the war cry? But not ready to move into action? And in doing something and dealing with this, the baggage of your life? Because we know that's the hard part. We know that's a difficult thing. We don't want to admit our fears and our failures. We don't want to admit that we're struggling in some areas of our life. We may not even be ready to admit that we have pain and hurts that are still impacting us today. But if we're not really, if we're not ready to step into action and do something about that, to try to climb a hill, to try to face your giant, to try to figure out why you're struggling with fear, then we're just stuck standing on the hill, victim of our circumstance. So I'm going to pray. And if any of this speaks to you in some way, um... You know, David heard clearly from the Lord to go down and face, face Goliath. That may or may not be what God would say to you. So I'm not just saying do anything you want. Do the right thing. <laughs> Take the right action. Um, look at the right choice. But what would that be? When Sandy pointed out the thing about the insecure leader... I said, uh-oh, <laughs> you're right. I think I need to go talk to God again. <laughs> I, think, I think he's talking to me again. Um, what would God say to you as we think of this story, baggage that you might have in your life? What does taking this next step look like for you? And don't let it sit might be saying, oh, oh, let's see how this, where we're going with it. Let's see how it turns out. And we put it out. We push it back. If God's calling you to take a some step, then don't wait. But with courage and trust that he has only good things for you, then step into that charge, that call. Father, we just give you thanks for this day.